Just let me know when you're ready back there. And um, let's go ahead and just open up a prayer. Let's believe God for a powerful time in His Word. So, Lord, we thank you for your presence that's here in such an awesome way. And, Lord, I ask you that you anoint and speak to me everything that needs to be spoken, Lord. I thank you for the power of the Word of God. Lord, we need your Word. We desperately need your Word. And Lord, I ask you by the awesome anointing of the Holy Spirit that your Holy Spirit just move upon every person that's going to be hearing this, that we can give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus, that the Holy Spirit will move upon our minds and our hearts to be good soil, that our minds will just get locked into what you're showing us, what you're um, revealing to us, and our hearts will be good soil. And by the Holy Spirit that you would anoint our eyes and ears, have eyes and ears of the Spirit. And Lord, that you would speak to me everything that needs to be spoken. It'll be as living seeds of truth sown out in a good soil, watered by the Holy Spirit, take root, grow, and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. Let there be a washing of the water of the word. Let the light of truth shine and dispel the darkness of the enemy and bring revelation and truth and power. And Lord, we thank you that your word will not return void, but accomplish that which you sent it forth to do. Now, Jesus said the birds of the air try to steal the seed. So, Lord, we submit this unto you. We resist the devil. We bind up anything of the enemy that would try to hinder, distract, oppress, resist this word in any way from getting where it's supposed to get, accomplishing what it's supposed to do. We bind him now in the name of Jesus. We commit it to back off and go. And, Lord, let your angels clear away every hindrance. And, Lord, we thank you for it, that the winds of your spirit carry this everywhere it needs to go. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers, meeting every need. We believe it. We expect it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to get uh, continue in this series on the book of Revelation. It's been a little bit different for me as a pastor. I always get sermons that are more life application. I don't necessarily do a lot of line upon line like this where you go through a specific book in the Bible and just stick to that um i'm used to the holy spirit usually uses me more in life application type sermons but in this case i really felt the lord wanted us to do this so we're going to go through the entire book of revelation and as we do i'm going to do my best by the grace of the lord to explain everything it's really it can be complicated and it can come across very confusing But once you understand symbolism and you understand what the Lord is saying and you get a grasp of the whole Bible, the book of Revelation is actually quite easy to understand. Once you see how the Lord is speaking through um, the various types of um, signs in there and the the different types of themes that God uses, etc. It's all through the Word, but you have to know the Bible to understand the book of Revelation because you have to understand the symbolism that's throughout the whole word. All right, so tonight as we get into this, I want to show you just up front Asia Minor in the first century. I put a little map there. And there were a lot of churches at this time. It's interesting that God chose these specific seven and all seven of them were in close proximity here um, on the west coast area of Asia Minor. And you can see them there. And you can also see the Isle of Patmos. It's a, you know small, but you can see it in the bottom left corner. It's this little isle, uh, probably about 20 miles off the coast, I believe, if I remember right. So anyway, that's where this was written to, these various churches that were there. And so last week we looked at the church of Ephesus and that church is a revival church it represents the early church the church that jesus christ planted through his disciples and the message of that was to not lose revival see the church at ephesus had some of the best teachers of that time obviously they had paul but they would have had timothy they would have had like apollos and priscilla and aquila they would have had john later on they had all these great teachers and they had a great mighty move of the holy spirit And it was everything that the church was supposed to be. But the Lord warned them not to lose that lampstand. Not to lose that first love. 
and we know that eventually that that lampstand was lost over time and so that's kind of going to be what we talk about today is seeing how exactly was the lampstand lost down through history and so first we're going to look at the church of Smyrna we're going to start Revelation chapter 2 starting with verse 8 let me just read it straight out of the word those that are following along make sure that you have something to write with take notes you'll want to jot some things down but in verse 8 it says and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write now this is how Jesus reveals himself the first and the last he who was dead and has come to life so Jesus is revealing himself take note of this because every time that the Lord is speaking to these churches it has significance on even the way he reveals himself he's revealed revealing himself as the one who was raised from the dead and given a glorified body the resurrection okay he said I know your tribulation and your poverty but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say that they're Jews and are not but are of but are a synagogue of synagogue of Satan do not fear what you are about to suffer behold the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days everybody say 10 days remember that because it's important as we go through history in a moment he said to be faithful unto death now notice that because the Lord knew what they were going to face be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life verse 11 he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death which is hell so the Lord is saying basically here do not deny me be faithful unto death even if you're going to be persecuted even if you're going to be tortured do not deny my name be faithful unto me unto death and if you are he said I will give you the crown of life and you will not be hurt by the second death which is hell all right so Smyrna if you look at these seven churches the reason why the Lord picked these seven is because they have prophetic significance down through the church age the church in Ephesus prophetically was the first church the early church that the Apostles oversaw and it transitions here to Smyrna and it goes down through these last 2,000 years and the last church the Laodicean church is prophetic of the day and age that you and I live which I'll get to that next week but it's a prophetic timeline down through these 2,000 years and so Smyrna being the next church after Ephesus is prophetically speaking from the years of around 37 to 312 AD it speaks of the the church in Ephesus was really up to probably John's day so probably around 96 so we could actually say really around the time of John's day that he wrote this until 312 but let me kind of show you what it represents Smyrna means crushed myrrh and in the Bible myrrh speaks of suffering and so it is if you think about also this symbolically speaks of the anointing oil because the olive has to be crushed to produce the oil and in the anointing oil of the Bible you have cinnamon cassia and calamus and you've seen cinnamon it has to be ground up and then myrrh the crushed myrrh so it speaks of the beautiful fragrant anointing oil but to get the oil there has to be a crushing and so Smyrna speaks of great persecution that happened in the early days of the church remember this because we'll come back to it later Satan was trying to destroy the church and so the first ten emperors were the 10 days that Jesus prophesied he said you're gonna suffer for 10 days and this was the prophecy unfolding I'm just gonna read it to you I wrote it here the the 10 emperors the first one being Nero Nero was alive during this day 
in Nero speaks from AD 37 to 68 and Nero was the one that killed Peter and Paul Nero also burned part of Rome he he was just a crazy individual he burned part of Rome and then whenever people got angry about it he blamed the Christians so uh, Rome began to really hate the Christians and it really began a severe persecution the second was Domitian and he was the one that exiled John to Patmos and that was from 81 to 96 then you have Trajan who was from 98 to 117 Ignatius the chief disciple Peter was thrown into a den of lions under Trajan Marcus Aurelius from 161 to 180 and some of the leaders like Polycarp and Justin were martyred along with many others during this um, the reign of uh, Marcus then Septimus Severus from 202 to 211 maximum from 235 to 237 he massacred the Christians and had their bodies buried in lots of 50 and 60 Decius from 249 to 253 he fiercely pers persecuted the church trying to destroy it and then Valerian from 257 to 260 Aurelian from 270 to 275 and finally the last one is Diocletian and he reigned from 303 to 312 and Diocletian was very violent toward the church as well so this was the 10 days that the church suffered severe persecution the first 300 years of its of its existence and this was prophesied in Smyrna being crushed myrrh it was the crushing and these were the 10 days the Lord prophesied Jesus appears as I mentioned earlier as the one who was dead is now alive and so Jesus was speaking to this church that even though you suffer unto death to be faithful to me unto death because I am the resurrection and the life and you will be raised to new life you will have eternal life and you will be resurrected from the dead as I said earlier Jesus said to them to be faithful unto death I'll give you the crown of life and to him who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death so again just repeating this prophetically this church speaks of the ten emperors who violently persecute the church from around 3780 to 312 this was Satan's first wave of warfare to kill and destroy the church but even though Satan tried everything he could to destroy this church it actually flourished under persecution and he was not successful so the enemy after around 300 years had to come up with a new strategy and this is where the church of Pergamum comes in and this is similar to other satanic tactics down through the ages the enemy tried this violent onslaught he tried like you know striking with a fist he tried to take a fatal blow to the church he wanted to kill all their leaders he wanted to intimidate them he took their loved ones during these you know ten emperors they were they saw their loved ones being burned on they would be dipped in oil and hung up on a stick and burned to light the streets of Rome they were thrown to lions in the Colosseum he tried everything he could just like you would take a fist and just crush but it never worked every time he killed them it was like more would spring up the church remained pure it remained strong it met from house to house God would raise up more leadership and nothing seemed to prevail so at some point in time Satan had to think to himself this tactics not working so I'm going to change tactics and unfortunately as I'm going to show you the next tactic of the enemy unfortunately was somewhat successful Satan will never win the war but sometimes there's a few battles that he seemed to have won and this unfortunately was one of them and I believe you'll see that as we go so the message to Pergamum and to the angel of the church of Pergamum write this the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says so notice this Jesus reveals himself as the one who has a sharp two-edged sword 
we know from the the bible interprets the bible what is the two-edged sword it is the word of god so jesus is revealing himself here as the word but the word coming in like a two-edged sword to begin to deal with things he said in verse 13 i know where you dwell where satan's throne is now think about that for a moment they dwelled where satan's throne is which i'll talk about in a moment and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of antipas and i'll talk about him he was jesus said my witness my faithful one who was killed among you where satan dwells verse 14 but i have a few things against you because you have some there who hold to the teachings of balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality. So you see compromise there. Verse 15. So you also have some who are in the same way hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which we talked about last week. Therefore, verse 16, repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So we'll break some of this down. It's quite a bit here to deal with, but... We'll look at the te what does it mean, the teachings of Balaam and the teachings of the Nicolaitans that I talked about last week. But you can see here that there was heresy and you can see that there was worldliness and there was immorality. There was compromise here in this church. And so Pergamum, let's break it down. Let's look at some history. Pergamum actually means marriage. And this was AD 312 to 5, 590. This was during this time in our history. This is a time that I'm going to show you where the church begins to marry the world through Constantine and his rise to power. Satan was not successful at like a violent onslaught against the church to smite it. Like you would take a fist and just strike at it. You would stomp it. You would crush it, intimidate. Nothing seemed to prevail. And so the enemy decides, I'm going to change my tactic. And here's what he does. He begins to bring in perversion, worldliness, mixture, defilement, pollution into the church world. And I'm going to show you here in a moment that's the same thing that the devil did back in the days of Balaam. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's look at some history. The city of Pergamum was also a very beautiful city of this time. It was not on the level of Ephesus, but it had three temples in it. And this is significant because these three temples made up like the satanic stronghold in Pergamum. There was a temple there dedicated to emperor worship, which was big in Rome. And then there was a temple there to Athena, and once again, you see some kind of a strong female type deity, which always seems to go back to Jezebel. And then you see, number three, there was a temple to Zeus, and there was an altar there to Zeus, which we're going to talk about. Now, just look this way, because I don't think a lot of this is in your notes, but some of it may be. But Zeus is the throne of Satan that was talked about here. See, Zeus had a temple, but he had an altar there. And the altar to Zeus was set up and there was actually human sacrifice, which I'm going to show you because of Antipas that took place there. And Satan must have felt very at home there on that throne to Zeus. Zeus, as you know, was the, the, the strongest, the most powerful of the Greek gods. And so his altar, the throne, so to speak, to Zeus was where Satan had his throne. Now, let me give you just a little bit here in Pergamum. There was also a healing center that had to do with the god, the Greek god Asclepius. This is important that y'all hear this because it has a lot to do with what's going on in this. 
this healing center. Asclepius was a Greek serpent god. And these Asclepian priests, so there was like a healing center and it had a priesthood. And these priests served and worshipped the god Asclepius who was a serpent god. And people would come from far and wide to this healing center to be healed by the god, the demon god Asclepius. The Asclepian priest had the rod of Asclepius which had a snake symbol that we see today in our medical industry. Somehow, this got into our medical industry here in America today. That's what the rod with the one or the two serpents around it is, is the rod to Asclepius. So, and let me tell you something, a lot of people don't know this and won't believe it till they look it up for themselves, but look up the Hippocratic Oath. And it swears to Greek gods like Apollo, which I find disturbing as a Christian. Why is our medical industry, why does it even have this stuff in it? But see, there was a healing center. And people came to this healing center, and here's what would happen. They would drink a sedative, and they would sleep in quarters that were provided for them there, and there were several non-poisonous snakes that crawled around in there at night because the demon god Asclepius was a Greek god that had to do with the serpent. And they were told that the serpent god Asclepius will speak to them in the night through a dream or a vision of some kind and give them the diagnosis to their illness. And so the people drank the sedative which helped them to go into a deep sleep and they would sleep there in these quarters and these snakes are crawling around them at night. These snakes believed to carry the healing power of Asclepius and if one of them crawled on you at night, it was a sign that the healing power of Asclepius was coming to you. The patients would have dreams and then the next day, they would tell their dreams to the priest of Asclepius. And the priest would give them, they would interpret the dream and give them a treatment based on that dream interpretation. And the priest then would make some kind of a mold of the body part that needed to be healed and then they would offer that up to the god of Asclepius. And they believed that by doing that, that the healing power of Asclepius would come to these people. So the priests of Asclepius were like guardians of this healing center of this city called, the, it, the, obviously the healing center was called the Asclepian. Alright, so also in this city, remember, the altar to Zeus, emperor worship, and this healing center, it formed some kind of a satanic stronghold in the city. Greeks and Romans, as we know, worshipped a myriad of different gods. But here's the thing. When Christianity came on the scene, Christianity only worships one god. So listen to this, because historically, this is what happened with Antipas. <laughs> so the priest of Asclepius testified. This is a historic fact, okay? That demons appeared to them in their dreams telling them that the prayers of Antipas were driving them out of the city and that they needed to do something about it spiritual warfare so the priest began to go on the offensive against Antipas and so in the days of Rome emperor worship was huge and the way that this would happen is, is the people would be brought there and they would have to take like a pinch, there was more, a little bit more to it, but they would have to take a pinch of incense and put it there and it would burn up and then they would declare, you know, that the emperor was Lord and Master. And, but see, you got to understand that not only were they worshipping the emperor, but it was seen as an act of loyalty to Rome. So if you refused to worship the emperor, you were seen as committing treason against Rome. 
Is this making sense? Which would be the penalty of death. So let me just read historically what happened. Antipas was brought to the temple, the one that was, the, you know, to worship the emperor. And he was to offer an offering of wine and incense to the emperor and declare that that emperor was true lord and master, which Antipas would not do, obviously. Now just think about this for a moment. So in the day and age that we live in America, this seems foreign, doesn't it? But imagine if we had some kind of, every state had some kind of a temple that we had to go there. And we had to, we were required by law to go there and to take like a pinch of incense and to burn it toward whatever leaders we have in this state, ultimately over the nation. And if we did not do that and worship them, that it was seen as a criminal act of treason punishable by death. Now you can only imagine, as I just read to you those ten emperors that violently persecuted Christians, how much of that went back to this very issue because the Christians refused to worship an emperor. So Antipas refused to do it, obviously. He was respectful, but he refused to do it. So Antipas was sentenced to death on the altar of Zeus. I don't even like talking about this, but you need to know it for history. So what they had on the altar to Zeus was a huge bronze bull. This huge bronze bull represented Zeus, and it was hollowed out. And what they would do is they would bind somebody hand and foot and they would stuff them up in the hollow part of that bull. And then they would put a huge amount of wood around it and they would set it on fire. And as that bull heated up, it would cook the person in there to death. And their moans and their groans, they had that hollowed out bull with its mouth open. It would sound eerie coming out of the mouth of the bull. All of that took place on the altar of Zeus. It was human sacrifice. And Jesus said that that was Satan's throne. And that's how Antipas died. He died being roasted to death in that bull. But history records that he died praying for his church. Isn't that awesome? So here's something interesting about the altar of Zeus. This very altar that I'm talking about, okay, was excavated, excavated and put on display, listen to this, in Berlin, Germany in 1930, right before the rise of Hitler. Isn't that interesting? And it's still, from what I understand, it's still there today. There's, there's something in Berlin like a, um, uh, a museum that's dedicated to Pergamum, and this altar was actually excavated and pulled up and moved to Berlin and is still there. In my opinion, how should I explain this? There's legal rights in Satan's kingdom. And when something like that happens, in my opinion, it gives the demonic realm legal ground, legal right to translate from one geographic location now to relocate to another geographic location. It's a way of moving demonic forces to another place. Does that make sense? You pull up the altar, you move it. And that's why so many Christians had such an, they were so upset because they were trying to create some kind of a, what was it in New York, I believe, where they were trying to set up something to bail. Remember that? And Christians were upset about it. It's like the last thing we need in America is to start welcoming these uh, foreign gods from other lands into our land. Amen. <laughs> We've got enough problems. So Jesus appears to this church here, which I'm going to show you here in a moment. There's more to this. But he appears to them, the one who has the two-edged sword in his mouth, to deal with things. He referenced the teachings of Balaam. He referenced the Nicolaitans. But he, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But to the overcomers, he said, if you will overcome, he said, you'll receive hidden manna, which is divine revelation of him. Did y'all catch that? Hidden manna is divine revelation of the Lord. 
and a white stone in that day was given to an accused criminal who was actually found innocent isn't that interesting this church though even though there was some faithfulness and there were some good things in Pergamum there was also a mixture that had come in now prophetically this speaks of the rise of Constantine and how he began to pervert the church so let me say this again and now I'm gonna give you because I gave you kind of the natural what was in the city at that time now I'm gonna give you prophetically what this represents okay so this remember this represents from 312 to 590 there was this period there after the great persecutions of the ten emperors Constantine comes to power I'm gonna read you some things just follow me all right so Constantine came to power after Diocletian And when he rose to power, he married the church with the state and perverted Christianity. Did y'all catch that? It's never a good thing when church and state marry together. And our founding fathers understood that. That's why they put in there about separating the church and state, but it was for our benefit. In other words, to keep them out of our business. Because the church is a spiritual government. You guys are quiet tonight. So Constantine rose to power. He married the church with the state, which I'm going to show you here in a moment. And Pergamum represents the adulterous church that compromises and is worldly. Let me just say something here. I know that you guys in River of Life know this, but it is extremely important how we live our lives. The Bible says for Christians to avoid even the appearance of evil you hear me I don't think any of us can probably even begin to understand how many people are going to be in hell because they did not see true Christians live a true Christian life and it turned them off to God it is extremely important that when people see our lives that they see righteousness they see something different amen that they're not seeing somebody that's still you know cussing and drinking and carrying on like the world does and partying and living in sin calling themselves a Christian because the people that all the people that see that are going to say to themselves they're no different than me and they're not going to believe that Jesus is real how many people are going to be in hell because they saw the church acting like that and so Pergamum speaks of that it speaks of like an adulterous church a compromising church a worldly church see when suffering persecution the church remained pure but now in Pergamum the church gets perverted so let's look at how did that happen so I'm going to read this to you give me your best ear because this is actually very important and it's even important for us today so true Christianity that Christ planted was so powerful that it seems nothing could stop it persecution only made it stronger and kept it pure but by the year 600 y'all look this way because this is not in your notes by the year 600 let me read this again true Christianity that Christ planted met in houses not that there's anything wrong with coming together corporately but they had powerful leadership they had the power of the holy spirit they had the power of god's word it was so powerful that nothing seemed that it could stop it persecution only made it stronger and kept it pure but hear me by the year 600 almost nothing that it characterized the early church remained what happened I mean, it, it was like something came in and shifted things where nothing that it characterized that early church remained. So let's look back at what happened. In 312 AD, Maxentius wanted the emperor throne of Rome. So did others. After Diocletian, there was like a vying for the throne. 
He challenged Constantine to battle. Constantine heard that Maxentius was a master of the dark arts, like witchcraft. So Constantine was scared, and he prayed out of fear. He prayed to the supreme God, which to him was Mithras, the Persian god. He had a vision as he was praying in the sky. Remember, he's praying to the Persian sun god, but he, he had a vision of like this cross in the sky next to the sun, along with the words conquer by this well to make a long story short constantine wins and takes the throne and because of this bizarre vision that he had he attributes it to the cross obviously he attributes it to the christians so constantine after all these years of persecution from nero to diocletian now constantine comes to the throne and he's he's being kind to the Christians because of that vision he had. Well, I mean, Christianity was thankful for it because up until that time, many of them had seen loved ones slaughtered. They had lost family. They had lost friends. They had been through so much. And now there was relief from that. So to them, this was like a weight lifted off them. But let me tell you as I go through this, and let me say that this disclaimer that we absolutely love Catholic people, okay? So as we're going through this, I'm going to deal with Roman Catholicism, but I'm not talking about individual people. We love Catholic people. And we've had Catholic people that show up here just like other people, and if they come, that's fine. They can worship here. But here's the thing, just like anybody that comes in here, anybody, they're going to hear the gospel. And when they hear the gospel, either they're going to accept the gospel or they're not going to accept the gospel. And if they don't, they're not going to stick around because they don't want to. But if they do accept the gospel, and this is for anybody, whether they're Catholic or they're Mormon or they're you know, Buddhist or whatever, when they get saved, I'm going to encourage anybody that gets saved that they need to find a good church that preaches the truth and has the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit an operation the gifts in operation and to my knowledge i don't know of any catholic churches that have that i'm not saying that critically i'm just saying that as a matter of fact so this is not against catholic people but we do need to talk about roman catholicism there is no reason to believe historically not one that constantine was ever truly born again he simply had some kind of a paranormal vision that he saw. As a Roman emperor, he was Pontifex Maximus, however you say it, the high priest. See, the emperor had a spiritual role. He was in charge of all the religious affairs of Rome, which included officiating at pagan temples, which he continued to do. So Constantine, when he comes to power, now he lifts the persecution. But you have to understand to him, in his mind, still the one true God was a blur. To him, it had always been the Persian sun god. To him, this was like a temple over here that he was going to create for Christians. But there was all these other temples to other gods, and he would continue to officiate at various temples. So what Constantine did was basically because he was the emperor, he set himself up now as being like, if you will, the first pope. He wanted to be over, he wanted to officiate over Christianity, but at the same time he was going to pagan temples and officiating those as well. And he now began to appoint his cronies to power over Christianity. Constantine called himself the great apostle. In his church of the holy apostles, he set up 13 monuments, 12 to the 12 apostles, and one for himself, which was larger than the others. <laughs> to Constantine, the Christians of that time seemed very uneducated, and he did not like the Jewish flavor of the church 
because Romans did not like the Jews. And he did not like the house churches. See, to him, everything needed to move into a temple. Because that's what they had always had. So under Constantine, the church began to become about a fancy, beautiful cathedral with professional clergy. And what I mean by that is not fivefold ministry apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers see those are anointed and appointed by god with spiritual authority what i'm talking about with professional clergy are those that met the approval of the state in particular of constantine these are professional hirelings So here's what happened over time, not in one day, but over a period of years. The spirit-led worship that was taking place in home churches. Let me say that again. The spirit-led worship. The gifts of the spirit, tongues, words and knowledge and healing, the power of those gifts that they were seeing on a regular basis in the house churches. People were being healed and delivered of things on a regular basis. Not to mention the great healings and miracles that were taking places in these homes. Now they were being exchanged for people coming to some kind of a temple. And listen, the solemn rituals, like temple rituals that Constantine oversaw them doing. Does that make sense? He had these real solemn rituals that took place in other pagan temples and now he was going to make people get out of these house churches. This happened over a period of years, but they gradually were forced out into these temples and now there was these solemn temple rituals. Any spirit-led worship was gone. All the gifts disappeared. There was no more healings and miracles. Now it was exchanged for solemn ritual religion in fact in 325 this is a very key thing in church history there was the council of Nicaea you need to remember this because this is a very key thing in our history in 325 in the council of Nicaea the decision was made by these people Constantine his cronies these so called leaders of Christianity they were self-appointed, by the way. But the decision was made to remove all Jewish roots of Christianity. To do away with anything that resembled Jude, you know, the Jewish heritage. Like uh, Up until that point, you have to understand the early church kept Passover. You know, kept Pentecost, tabernacles. They would have honored the day of the Lord, the Sabbath. There was a very Jewish flavor of Christianity that had been there for 300 years. But in the Council of Nicaea, now that Constantine came to power and appointed his cronies, the Romans did not like the Jews. They didn't want anything resembling some kind of a Jewish heritage, and they systematically removed it. And over time, it became so persecuted that you better not have anything to do with it. As that was removed out, it created like a void, a vacuum, that now the influx of the paganism and the idolatry began to infiltrate the church. And to this day in Roman Catholicism, you see so much paganism and so much idolatry. How in the world? I love, I love Catholic people. This isn't sarcastic to Catholics. I'm just stating a fact. How can you get around the Ten Commandments when numero uno says not to have other gods, not to create graven images, and don't bow down to them? And the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church create idols and bow down to them. How do you get around that? This came in through what I'm talking about. The influx of paganism, the influx of idolatry. Pretty soon, over time, gradually, 
The new birth, how many knows we got to be born again? The new birth took a back seat to simply converting to a religion. That's why I've tried to get away from using the word conversion. Even though there's nothing necessarily wrong with the word itself, I just, I want to put the emphasis on being born again. Because you're not converting to a religion, you're experiencing a new birth, and there's something very different about that. But all of a sudden, being born again, that wasn't talked about, that was not important, as long as you converted to that religion. Since there was no persecution now, people simply you have to understand, people were not repenting of their sins. People were not being born again. They simply came in and joined a religion of so-called Christianity while still going to other pagan temples and worshiping there. It was just another temple and another God. But over time, over time, it gradually got to where Roman Catholicism did away with the other temples and it became just about the one God, but still there was so much perversion. Over the years, the light of the gospel was completely snuffed out. And that led into the dark ages. So what Satan tried to do by striking the church through those ten emperors, he was not successful. But now he was successful at perverting the church. See, that's what Balaam did. That's why Jesus referenced Balaam. I want you all to really hear this. Balaam, remember there was the king of Moab named Balak. He was scared of Israel because he heard about all that God did for Israel when they came out of Egypt all the great plagues and so he hired Balaam Balaam was actually a very powerful very adept master of the dark arts a powerful um, witch a powerful occultist of his time and Balak believed that if Balaam cursed him they'd be cursed he had a reputation and so Balak hires Balaam to come Balaam was like a false prophet. He definitely had mixture in his life. His, uh, his motive was making money. But anyway, he gets out there and he tries to curse Israel. How many are familiar with this story? Because I don't want to belabor it too much. He tries to curse Israel, but every time he tries to curse them, he ends up blessing them. And Balak's standing there and loses his temper every time. I paid you to curse them. <laughs> and you're blessing them. And Balaam basically said, I can't curse them. They're blessed by God. I can't curse them. And so if you read the story and you, you research all this out and study it, you find that Balaam told Balak, I cannot curse them directly. So just like the devil tried to attack through those ten emperors and strike the church, it never prevailed. Balaam tried that frontal attack against Israel. It didn't work. And so Balaam told Balak, but I'll tell you how you can weaken them and defeat them. He said, seduce them. Get all the be beautiful Midianite Moabite women to go out there and seduce the men sexually to come with them to fornicate, but also to come and worship the gods of the Moabs, the Moabites. And by doing that, it will, it will pervert things and God will judge them. And that's exactly what happened. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands that died in the plague because of that. So Balaam, because Jesus references this, Balaam taught if you cannot defeat them by a front on attack like that, Balaam said, bring in perversion and that will bring them down. That's the teachings of Balaam. And that's exactly what happened to the church. Now there were always true Christians. How many knows the Bible says back in the days of Elijah? You know, Elijah was so depressed. He said, I'm the only one. But God told Elijah, he said, it's not true. 
He said, there's, and now, out of a whole nation, 7,000 isn't a lot. But he said, I still have 7,000 that haven't bowed their knees to Baal and haven't kissed him. God's always had a remnant. So even as Roman Catholicism rose to power, you have to understand, Constantine being the emperor, he had a lot of wealth. He had the military. He had the power to try to dominate the church, which he did, and to take over. But yet, there were always a remnant of people down through the ages that never bought into it. They, they were born of God. They loved God. They loved his word. And so let me tell you just real quickly about a few. If you want to look into it, look up the Waldenses and the Albigenses, or however you say it. They were groups of people that, that loved God and were faithful to him. But let me give you another one. How many of you guys have heard of Wycliffe? Wycliffe had come to regard the scriptures as the only reliable guide to truth about God. Isn't that awesome? He lived in the days when Roman Catholicism was, I mean, at full power. But Wycliffe never bought into it. He believed that in faith in Christ alone. He believed that, you know, you had to be born of God. And he believed that the common people needed to have a Bible. And so Wycliffe risked his life to translate the Bible into the common language of the common people. And he had followers, and they, they called them the Lollards, and these followers were people that would go around witnessing of Christ to, to others. But listen, Wycliffe had come to regard the scriptures as the only reliable guide to the truth. How many feel that way? I do. The Bible is the source of truth. It does not matter different people's opinion unless it is in agreement with the Bible. It's just wrong. And so he believed the Bible was the source of all truth and maintained that all Christians should rely on it rather than the unreliable and frequently self-serving teachings of the popes and clerics. So he translated the Bible, as I said, for the common man. Roman Catholicism hated him so much, they never were able to kill him. They wanted to, but Wycliffe ended up dying of natural causes. But Rome, Roman Catholicism hated him so much that they formally decreed him a heretic and they actually sent people 44 years after his death to dig up his bones and to curse them and then to burn them because he was a heretic. <laughs> That's kind of psycho, friend, isn't it? Anyway, and see, Wycliffe had followers, and somebody that he really inspired was a man by the name of John Huss. How many have heard of John Huss? He gave his life for the gospel. He truly believed the gospel of Jesus Christ with all of his heart. He believed the Bible. He believed that you had to be born again. So what did Roman Catholicism do? They deemed him a heretic. They hunted him down. They captured him. And they burned him alive in a public execution for believing the gospel. And as he burned, he sang worship to God. The further things went with Roman Catholicism, the more perverse, the more violent, and the more evil it became. It rose to so much power that the kings of nations were terrified of Rome. Because if the leadership in the Vatican declared them to be a heretic, even kings would be dethroned and burned at the stake. Everybody feared them. And they massacred anybody that did not agree with them. Anybody that accepted Christ as their Savior believed that you could truly have a personal relationship with him and they did not agree with the teachings of Rome. They were labeled a heretic. They were hunted down. And they were slaughtered. But it didn't just stop there. Anybody that didn't agree with Rome, including Muslims and Jews or whatever, the same thing. They were forced to either convert or they would be killed. Sounds like Islam, doesn't it? The final straw... Roman Catholicism, the final straw was things had gotten so corrupt, so perverted, so evil over time that 
Rome had to figure out, well, how are we going to pay for all of our big fancy cathedrals? They wanted to build St. Peter's Cathedral and they wanted to do all these things that cost a lot of money. So here's what they did. They decided that they were going to sell indulgences. So they go from city to city and they had emissaries that represented Rome. Riding in on their horses, you know, shouting out. You, they basically were telling people, you can buy an indulgence. And what that means is, that if you want to go out and sin tomorrow for so many X amount of dollars or whatever, whatever the currency was, and what, however big the sin was, it would cost more, <laughs> you could pay for an indulgence. And it wasn't limited to living people. They said, you can pay for your dead relatives to come out of purgatory. Things had gotten so wicked so corrupt that now you could so-called buy your salvation through Rome. There was a man, a German. He was a monk. He was the order of Augustinian. St. Augustine. He was an Augustinian monk. How do you say that? Martin Luther. He saw that. He saw how corrupt things had gotten. The selling of indulgences. The worshipping of relics. And being a monk, he had studied the word. He, he was so enraged by what he saw. How perverted things have gotten. That he nailed his 95 thesis on the doors of the church in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517. And it started the Protestant Reformation. It began the downfall of Roman Catholicism. But that is represented in the church of Pergamum. So if you go back and read the story here, or read the scriptures rather, Jesus said, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now think about it in your mind. In the natural, you have the altar of Zeus, but in the spiritual, you have what Rome became. So think of it that way, okay? Now as I read it again, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. How many people lost their life for being a true Christian because of Rome hunting them down and killing them? He said, I have a few things against you. You hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, eat things sacrificed to idols, commit acts of immorality. And some of you hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Remember that? The Nicolaitans believe Greek asceticism where everything with the body is evil and everything with the spirit is pure. That's nonsense. But they brought that in. It created a heresy where people believed that what they did with their body would not affect them spiritually. And Jesus said in the last church to the Ephesians, remember he said, I hate the teachings of the Nicolaitans. But anyway, he said, therefore repent or I'm coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. That kind of makes me think about Martin Luther in 1517 where he stood so firmly on that scripture, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where it says, it is by grace that we're saved through faith. Y'all see that? The sword. And it started the Protestant Reformation. And then the last church is Thyatira. And I'm going to close with this. The message to the church of Thyatira, Thyatira, it says, and to the angel of the church, right? Now listen how Jesus reveals himself. The son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze. So you have to know symbolism. Bronze in the Bible always speaks of judgment. So Jesus' feet, the Bible talks about him where it says that all of his enemies would be brought under his feet, you see. It has to do, 
The God of peace crushes Satan under our feet. There's something about everything being under his authority. There's something here with the bronze representing his judgment. And his eyes being a fire that he sees what he needs to see in the fire of his holiness, the fire of his spirit to deal with it. So in the previous church, it seemed to be the Lord was going to deal with it with his word, the two-edged sword. But in this church, the fire of the Holy Ghost was going to come in and deal with it. Is this making sense? He said, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. So, you know, they were doing more than what they had did early on. They were, they were increasing their good works, etc. But he said in verse 20, but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, now there's something about the Jezebel spirit that I've seen down through the ages. The Lord gives space to repent and most of the time for whatever reason they don't repent. They'll talk about it. They know they need to. They'll pray about it. They'll cry about it. All of this. But at the end of the day they don't change. And so the Lord said if they don't repent he said I will have to judge them. Bring judgment. He said in verse 22, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her in the great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds and I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one according to your deeds. But I say to you the rest who are in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them I will place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and who keeps my deeds until the end. There's some great promises here. To those that overcome this Jezebel spirit. He said to him, I will give authority over the nations. And it says in one translation, to dash the nations to pieces like pottery. That's widespread authority over princes and powers. And to rule with a rod of iron. You know what that is? Iron is not easily bent, is it? When you rule with a rod of iron, that means that inside you have an inner strength that I will not be manipulated or controlled. And he said, and I will give him. He said, as also I have received authority from my father, I will give him the morning star. The morning star has to do a great thing favor think about those promises if you face Jezebel and overcome it says I will give you authority to dash the nations to pieces you're going to have widespread authority over principalities and powers you'll rule with a rod of iron where you will not be easily manipulated or intimidated by people and you'll have great favor on your life those are awesome promises so he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches so after we saw Pergamum and after the rise of Roman Catholicism, now Thyatira, Thyatira is kind of the logical next step because as Pergamum brought in all of this mixture, the Thyatira shows that this Jezebel spirit begins to come in power and rule over. Thyatira means continued sacrifice and that is what Roman Catholic Mass symbolizes. So Thyatira was a little city in Asia Minor. The chief industry there, listen to this, I'm about to close but you need to hear this. The chief industry there was fabric dyeing and fortune telling which was extremely prevalent in this day, in this city. The great rebuke of this church was tolerating Jezebel. So this spoke of the Dark Ages between around 600 
till around 1517 when Martin Luther nailed his door or nailed rather the thesis on the door or roughly around a thousand years think about what I'm saying guys in our history there was a thousand year period called the dark ages where the the lampstand had been removed gross darkness came in the light of the gospel was snuffed out people that were truly God's people like the Waldenses the followers of Wycliffe people like John Huss and others they basically had to flee from Rome they were being hunted down and persecuted but that thousand year period known as the dark ages was a very difficult time and what happened was as so you know Pergamum as this came in with all this mixture it gave rise to the Jezebel spirit to come over and sit enthroned over Roman Catholicism and that's where you get that queen of heaven it's Jezebel and I say this in love but I, I myself am, have some family ancestry that was Roman Catholic I, I, I love Catholic people but I'm saying this to try to help people I have not ministered to somebody that's either come out of Roman Catholicism or it was in their family that did not deal with the Jezebel spirit. It opens the door for Jezebel to come into their life and in their family bloodline. So, in this particular city though, looking at the natural, the history of this time, fortune telling was rampant. You have to understand that the Greeks were really into this fortune telling and just real quickly I'm gonna close out with all this I'm telling you but this is important about Jezebel Jezebel is basically a spirit of witchcraft control you cannot tolerate Jezebel's witchcraft control and anytime you see witchcraft you're gonna see rebellion that's where you get these little you know belittling of male authority tearing down male authority left-handed comments about male authority the ungodly control but Jezebel also has an affinity if you will toward the occult and so you see the Jezebel spirit many times is a seducing spirit yes there can be a seducing in the sexual immorality and yes there can be a seducing into compromising your godly convictions things that you normally wouldn't do you know are not right to be doing the Jezebel spirit will seduce people into compromise worldliness but also Jezebel will try to seduce people into the occult and he creates this mixture and the branches of the occult just in a nutshell real quickly one of them is sorcery sorcery is the material branch so anything material you know some look at it like they go to a witch doctor who gives them a potion by drinking that it'll enable them to get pregnant they're wanting fertility so they go to him and that's a form of sorcery but sorcery is anything material something in your possession a rod something you you wear like a charm or a talisman or anything material in your life that is supposed to bring you power is supposed to bring you luck bring whatever they're after they're wanting money to come to them they're wanting you know sex to come to them whatever it is something in their possession that is sorcery witchcraft is the branch of the occult that's the power branch people learn through various rituals they learn how to conjure up and call down spirits to curse their enemies and to control people through the dark arts but this is where I'm going with this the the other branch the third branch of the occult is divination divination has to do with information so people may look to the zodiac they look to constellations they they go to somebody that's into various forms of reading which is called scrying in the cult where they read maybe palms tarot cards tea leaves crystal balls whatever they read to get information or they'll go to somebody that's a psychic or a clairvoyant or somebody that consults the dead all of that is divination it's the information branch of the occult which is what we're dealing with here see fortune telling was rampant in this city apparently somebody that had another spirit about them was in the church 
prophesy. But it was another spirit. And let me tell you how deceptive this can be. You remember in Philippi, Paul had to deal with this in a similar situation. Different city than Thyatira. But see, in Philippi, there was this whole weird thing in Greek mythology about this oracle. Apparently, one of the gods dropped an oracle, like a scroll that fell down in the cliff. And every year, they would have some weird witchy woman come and would sit there and she would channel these spirits. And people would come to her and pay her great you know, wealth to give her their psychic information. And this was going on in Philippi. And when Paul comes there, one of the slave girls that was used in this way to, to offer divination like a psychic starts following Paul and listen to what she was saying. She was saying about him, this man is telling you the way to be saved. He's a servant of the Most High God telling you the way to be saved. So she was giving accurate information and by all accounts she would seem like a prophet of God. Are y'all following me? This in the natural, if you were just going to look at this with no discernment, this woman seemed like a prophet. She had some kind of supernatural information that she was going around saying, hey, I know some information here. These men are actually servants of the Most High God and they are telling you the way to be saved. If Paul did not have discernment about him, he would have thought that woman was a prophet or a prophetess and would have brought her into his ministry just like they did in Thyatira. And it would have brought in mixture to his ministry. It would have defiled and polluted the ministry. Pretty soon, Paul's ministry would have had a little witch with him. And people would be lining up to hear her little fortune she wants to give them. Thinking it's prophecy from God. See, there's some things Jesus said about Pergamum. I'm going to deal with you with the sword of my mouth, with my word. It's going to come in like a two-edged sword. And I believe that was prophesied by the Protestant Reformation through Martin Luther. It was the word that came in and dealt with it. But in this situation, it had to be discerned by the Spirit. You have to discern a Jezebel by the Spirit. Because they may give accurate information. They may give supernatural information they should not know. But it is not from the Holy Spirit. It is from a demon. And Jesus said about this church, I'm going to judge that with the fire of my spirit. Like a burning coming in. And let me tell you, when the fire of God comes, <laughs> you guys remember the story when Paul went to that island of Malta and he was there and they started a fire. There was all this wood that was there and so they started a fire. And all of a sudden, as the fire burned, a snake came shooting out of the fire and bit Paul's hand. Anytime the fire of the Holy Ghost starts really moving, demons are going to manifest. But you cannot tolerate Jezebel. They have some kind of an uncanny ability to worm their way into all kinds of different places in the church. And just like here, you see, they want to worm their way in to being a teacher and to being some kind of a prophetess that people come to to give information. They want to lay, hand, lay hands and pray over people on the altar, and you cannot put up with it. Examine their life, examine the fruit of their life, but you've got to discern it by the Spirit of God. So Jesus appeared. Let me just close this out by reading this. Jesus appeared to this church as the son of God that's male strong male authority y'all hearing me there's got to be to deal with Jezebel there's got to be somebody that's not going to put up with it that's in authority strong male authority whose eyes are a fire to discern it and to deal with it by the fire of the spirit and burnished bronze his feet were burnished bronze he appears as the judge to purge the church. And as I said before, Jezebel's rebellion and witchcraft control cannot be tolerated. And also any counterfeit revelation from a Jezebel cannot be tolerated. 
judgment that comes to an unrepentant Jezebel includes sickness and premature death. But those that are an overcomer receive widespread authority over princes and powers, rule with a rod of iron, and have great favor. So let's go ahead and shut down recordings. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We bless you. Lord, I pray that this will really get in our lives and do a work in us. So we thank you for your faithfulness, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.